Good morning. Welcome. I'm Steve Johnson. I'm the guy that uh, is supposed to tell you to put your cell phones on uh, uh, um, stun or thrill mode uh, or turn them off altogether. Um, I'm the director of the Americas program and uh, I'd like to welcome you to CSIS and, and thank you again uh, for coming this morning. We have a very interesting program for you. Um, I want to thank our guests, uh, distinguished uh, Alberto Aleman Zubieta, the uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Panama uh, Canal Authority, uh, Bill Lane, the Director of Government Affairs for Caterpillar Equipment, and our own Meredith Broadbent, a CSIS uh, Senior Advisor and holder of the Scholl Chair in International Business. To begin, no two countries have had histories more intertwined than the United States and Panama, and probably no country is more associated with a wonder of the world than Panama. From the beginning of its existence, it stood as a hallmark of man's quest to overcome geography and communicate with brothers and sisters all over the world. No surprise then that Panama is one of the world's great crossroads whose society reflects mankind's great diversity. Like many of you, I've stood in awe watching great cargo ships transit the canal. Personally, I reflect how that marvel brought my own family together. My great uncle was a managing engineer under General Gothels. My great grandfather-in-law was one of the West Indian laborers who dug the canal. For nearly a century, it has served the world as a peaceful channel for maritime commerce between the East and West. During World War II, it hosted the U.S. Caribbean Defense Command and for many years thereafter was a welcoming home for the United States Southern Command where I was assigned militarily. Today, Panama is a country that is doing a lot of things right. First among many visionary and forward-leaning projects is expanding the canal on the centennial of its original construction. Two-thirds of the canal's transits are bound to or come from U.S. ports, so we stand to benefit a lot. I could go on and tell you all about it myself, and I'd love to do that, but instead, I'd rather introduce you to the real expert. Alberto Aleman Zubieta is, as I said before, the Chief Executive Officer of the Panama Canal Authority, the autonomous agency that manages the Panama Canal and the leading interoceanic waterway that serves maritime commerce. Alberto is a native of Panama City, a graduate of Texas A&M University. He began his career in construction and for many years was head of the largest construction companies in Panama. From 1996 to 1999, he served as administrator of the former Panama Canal Commission, the U.S. government agency that was responsible until 1999 for the administration and operation of the canal. In 98, two years into his appointment as head of the commission, he was named administrator of the Panama Canal Authority, the entity tasked with uh, the administration of the waterway upon its transfer to the Republic of Panama on December 31st, 1999. In 2005, the Board of Directors re-elected him to lead the authority for another seven years. Alberto's vision has been to transform the canal into a world leader in maritime services, to be the cornerstone of the global transportation system, and a model of excellence, integrity, and transparency. He's a member of various international organizations, such as the International Advisory Board of Texas A&M University, the World Economic Forum, the Panamanian Cha Chamber of Construction, and the Panamanian Association of Architects and Engineers. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to present a distinguished leader of the Americas and a great friend of the United States, Alberto Aleman. Thank you. Good morning. Um, it's always very exciting to be here in, uh, in Washington. I, as uh, was mentioned, I had the uh, distinct pleasure of, uh, of actually running. I was the only non-U.S. citizen who actually runs a federal, federal uh, uh, commission. I used to work for the, uh, for the U.S. government. I was a federal employee in a period of my, my life. Um, and actually, it was a very exciting year. And, and really, you know, when I think about where we are today, I have to reflect back where we were maybe 14 years ago. And uh, in those days, there was a lot of doubt, not only internationally, but also locally in Panama, 
uh, about, because Panama was about to actually be transferred, the Panama Canal, to a, from the most powerful nation in the world to a very <coughs> tiny little nation in, the, in, in Central America. <laughs> and this is a very key and important waterway for world commerce. So there was a lot of basically criticism, uh, doubt, and um, as, a, as we go back and reflect on that, in, uh, in 1997, uh, and I, I replaced a great engineer and a great person, uh, Gilberto Guardia, who was the first Panamanian administrator of the Panama Canal Commission then, uh, and Gilberto actually was the one, the person that started um, uh, in a very uh, interesting way the expansion of the Geller Cut. Um, and he did that um, because uh, it was a requirement that you have to fund every, all the money in the budgets to be able to do a project, you know, and that's uh, a, it was around 500 to $600 million project. So Gilberto was very um, intelligent and said, no, let's do this in small projects. You know, so then he, put, he budgeted small, you know, air moving projects. And that's how he started the expansion of the Geller Cut. Uh, so he put, you know, maybe 50 million this year, and then the next year we'll put some more, and, and that way he started expanding the, um, uh, the, the Geller Cut. In 1997, in September of 1997, we were celebrating the, uh, the signing of the Torrijos uh, Carter Treaty, and we put together in Panama a, and this is a very key issue, because we put in those, in those days what we call the Universal Congress of the Panama Canal in reference, to a Congress that uh, Ferdinand de Lesseps did back in uh, when he was putting uh, or starting the idea of, of building the canal in Panama. But it was a different Congress this time around. This time around, um, I had to face the different segments of the industry and they, they were all saying that, you know, we were going to kill the, uh, the, uh, the, the chicken with the golden eggs, uh, we were going to milk the canal dry, and you know, they said all those things in front of publics. And I, and I said, you know, what Panama is going to do with the tariff? Uh, is Panama is going to raise the tolls. You know, it's going to be, you know, you're going to try to get all the money. And I said, well, look, uh, very simple. I think that the market will define how, how much Panama can do, because otherwise if you go one penny above what you should charge, you know, you can move around and go somewhere else. Uh, because that, that was this idea that Panama has a monopoly on, the, on this route, and that if you don't like to go through the Panama Canal, you have to go around the, the horn and then, you know, go somewhere else. And that really was not the case. But more importantly, in that Congress, we, there were two studies presented on, um, on what, you know, what, what was the demand for the Panama Canal. One study was done by a uh, U.S. company, and the other one was given to Panama by the uh, European Union as part of the Congress. Both studies reflected, or actually came to be about the same, different, you know, not exactly the same, but very close, that the Panama Canal was going to have a capacity uh, problem in the year 2011, which is this year. And actually, um, that made me reflect in those days, just getting, you know, to, to know the turf and start, you know, making the changes in the canal, we were actually in that, in that, in the, in that preci precise year, we were basically finishing in Panama, uh, putting together the organic law uh, that created the Panama Canal Authority. So we were in that process uh, of, of the transfer. We decided to put together a team of engineers in the canal and make a special office that we call the capacity office of the canal. And actually, we concentrated in that office Every single study that has been made uh, since the canal was started on, on what the canal should do on solving this capacity issue. First to see if it was for, it was for real. We were all, at that time basically starting a, a program to modernize the Panama Canal as part of the requirements of the transfer of, of the canal to, so that the U.S. could transfer the canal back in good working uh, condition. And that was a very uh, interesting program itself that we then continue actually after we took over and in fact Panama has spent over 1.6 billion dollars in these uh, 10 years you know upgrading the actual canal 
you know, growing, maximizing his capacity because we needed to basically be able to manage, you know, uh, the, um, the, the, the need for the Panama Canal. When, when we did that, actually it was the uh, base for the study that we put together that eventually we, we called the master plan for the Panama Canal. And that was a plan that actually defined what we needed to do in short, medium, and long term. And then start you know, putting all these, these uh, studies and work together to see what we could do. The, the uh, idea of putting a third set of locks is not a new idea. In fact, the U.S. started building the third set of locks in 1939 and actually stopped that work in 1942 because of the war. Uh, and they spent $80 million of 1939 dollars. So it's a lot of money. They did a lot of excavation back then. In fact, we're using most of those excavations in this project. Uh, I, I got to see in 1995 for the first time uh, when I was doing a pro bono work uh, for the, uh, actually for the uh, Board of Directors, Binational Board of Directors of the Panama Canal. Uh, they showed me in the district, district, uh, district, uh, district sorry, of the uh, U.S. Corps of Engineers, they showed me, you know, here is the third set of locks. You know, and I saw, wow, you know, these are the plans, you know, for a complete set of plans. Who never, who never got to be built. Um, so when we decided this was because I, f I found that, you know, running the canal and moving ships from one uh, end of, the, of one ocean to the other actually is, I would say, common things that we do every day. In, the canal has been working like that, and the people who run the canal, most of them were Panamanians. So I have no doubt that we have the capacity and the people to run the canal properly. But there was a different, actually, approach. And I have the opportunity, and actually, I've been blessed by the fact that I run the canal for the US, and I also run the canal for Panama. And I think this is one of the great success stories, actually, because there were people who, as I mentioned before, they have this doubt. And now to, nowadays, the canal, I think, when people say that the canal is run better than the, uh, than the US, actually, is because we're running a different system. Okay? And we have a different approach. For the, for the U.S., this was a break-even operation. Basically, um, the, the, uh, for the shipping industry, basically they were paying only for the cost of the, op of, of the operation of the canal. So they were having a great time. Um, and we have to match the uh, incomes with the expenses. And in a, in a corporation, it's very simple. If you're a manager, you're only managing a budget. And actually, the idea is to spend all of the budget, you know, which is actually because otherwise they will cut it. Uh, when we got there, we said, no, actually, we need to manage a resource. In fact, a funny story is that uh, in, the, uh, in the last two years of the transfer, um, according to the, to the treaty, if there were any excess of, uh, of money, they should be transferred to the Republic of Panama. The first year, in 1998 uh, fiscal budget, we had a surplus of about $8 million, if I recall correctly. And my deputy, a great guy, came and see me and said, Alberto, we have a problem. I said, you know, what do you mean we have a problem, Joe? And he said, well, we have uh, this surplus. I suppose, you know, we have, you know, we're now closing the books and, and we got money and we are supposed to be break even. And I said, look, Joe, that's okay, you know. You know, we actually budget for, for uh, break even, and so then the money will be transferred to Panama. So that's what it happens. The next year, he came back to me and said, Now we are a bigger problem. He said, What's the problem now? He said, Well, we got some close to $30 million in. in uh, and I said, Look, Joe, the way I see it, I think that the White House should call both you and me, you know, uh, to the White House, and I should be given a price because we are running a, a, an agency. Break even, and I'm sure we're making a surplus. And we have done exactly everything that we need to do. We haven't let you know any, any maintenance. Everything we said to do, we did it. But we are managing its resources. The so people in their mentality are no longer trying to spend all of the money. That they, that they have the money, and now they have controls in which to make it work better. And I'll tell this because actually we needed to change the culture of the place. Uh, it was different, it was difficult for some of the people over there 
to actually be able to manage that type of change. And there was also, inside of the organization, a lot of doubt. Uh, so when we started, actually, now, when you reflect about it, you know, Panama did not raise tolls when we received the canal in the year 2000. In fact, we raised tolls in the year 2002. Because we, we did a lot of things first that actually provided a better service. We changed some of the reservation system. We started understanding the, the, our customers. We started talking to them. We started you know, understanding what their needs were. And then we made a big decision because you know, there was a lot of pressure to maintain the canal as a utility. And we said, no, we're going to run it as a profit center, as, as a corporation, and it should be run as a corporation. And one of the big, the big part of the success story is that the Republic of Panama, and I think that the success of the canal is owned to the people of Panama. And when I say this, I said it, you know, because it was the, the, uh, the, the uh, maybe one of the only times in, in which I see our country get together and then decide that the canal should be, you know, a change, a, a change in the Constitution, which is not easy, and sometimes they try to change it, you know, uh, from time to time, but in this case, everyone got together and created a, a title in the constitution of the country that says this is the way the canal should be run. And then we went into a process that, that is called the organic law, in which there was a lot of discussion with every member of the civil society of, the, of, the, of, of Panama, and we got a common goal. And that is why the canal has this structure, uh, this legal structure that define the way that it should, that it, it front today. So it was a decision of the Society of Panama that give this mandate to those who are, of us who are working in the canal. Now, when we, when we get to the, um, to, to start doing this analysis, then, you know, in, in those days, um, we decided then to, to set the tolls in a different fashion the first time around. We understood that we were not dealing with one industry. We were dealing with many industries. In this break-even operation on the, under the US, every ship was the same. You know, it didn't matter if it was a container ship or it was a passenger ship or it was a, a bulker. Basically, we measured the, the ships the same way, one size fits all, okay? Because we only needed to basically take the amount of tonnage that was going through the canal, charge X dollars per ton, per Panama Canal ton, and then Basically, that was it, divided amongst everything was the same. And we said, no, we are in a, in a totally different industry because we understood that the container industry was totally different from the bulkers, from the passengers. They have different needs uh, and so on. So we basically decided to, that the first toll structure, we, we changed the structure into eight different segments. And we modify then uh, the toll you know, slightly up. Obviously, there was a lot of cry, you know, you know, you are raising tolls and blah, 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 okay? But we basically start sending a very important message, how we were going to run the canal. And we had huge discussions, which then, at uh, the same time, we were preparing this program, uh, which was also very interesting what happened over there. So in the toll structure, for instance, there was an issue with the container trade. Under the U.S., we, should, we could not charge on deck, uh, the on-deck cargo. And that was done in the 30s because someone decided in those days there were no container ships. And basically the on-deck cargo, which used to be the captain's cargo, basically um, there were, um, uh, basically was locks who were put on top of the deck. And someone maybe in one of the uh, states where they basically were logging and sending those for uh, the world trade, decided that, you know, that was a small amount of money to be charged by the canal and therefore you, we should take it out. And that was a decision, it was taken out. And therefore we could not measure any ship, anything above deck. Well, in 1997, when we had the last toll increase by the US, and actually that was my first day at the job, by the way, in 1996, uh, when I got in and I was sworn on, on Sunday, on Monday we have a board meeting and the board meeting decided to raise tolls and said to me, well, now you want raise tolls. Well, we, in that, in, in that uh, we decided that we wanted to charge for the on-deck cargo for the container, containers. They put a huge lobby 
uh, here in Washington, and I had to come to Congress, and th thanks to a great congressman, Herb Bateman, from Virginia Beach, we explained to him what was going on. And, uh, and Herb called this meeting, and we explained, and eventually they allow us to do a reverse mathematics to put into the formula of how we measure the, the ship a percentage of that volume because it was based on how much money the canal can actually charge to maintain the canal break even. So we put that small percentage over there. But I told the industry back then, I said, look, in, in the next three years, Panama is going to take over. And believe me, that I'm going to charge 100% of it. Okay. Actually, we did that in, 19, in 2004. Because first, we needed to segment the market. Because otherwise, every time we will do a, a total increase, has to do for all of the ships. And they were a very specialized part uh, of, of, the, uh, of, of the industry. So I told them then, well, now. We're going to charge the full volume. So you, we can do it either by TEU, that's the way you manage your industry, or we can do it by volumetric measure. You have your a, you know, select. So we got to an agreement, and, and then we changed, actually, the way we measure those ships, and we started measuring them by, per TEU of capacity. And we put a, and, they came, and then they claimed that we were raising the total 65%, which was actually not true, because we were only charging for that part that they were getting away with. Okay, that was about 65% that actually goes on deck. And then I'm making this, this to you so you can understand the, some of the issues that we were dealing with with the industry and, and how we get to this program. So when we were analyzing, you know, how can we basically maintain the canal as a, as a very uh, important waterway? Our idea is not basically to take away the restriction the canal has today and make a bigger canal. It's not about that. It's actually to maximize what I believe is the biggest asset of my country, that is our, our geographical position. Because otherwise, we will, we will become a secondary road, and I don't want that to happen. And you see why. You know, and that's, that's why I believe that it's so important. Because by doing this, Panama is becoming, and it will become, the most important logistic and transportation center of the Americas. Some people try to, to, to say that Panama will be the next Singapore. And I believe that we have much more than Singapore to offer. And, and I explain later why. So when we're putting this program together, we made some mistakes. We made mistakes as engineers. You know, uh, one of them was that we went to the uh, to what we call the Western watershed, and we start analyzing where we're going to get water. You know, nothing wrong to do a study. The other thing that we did not took into account that people who live in those places, you know, believe that we were going to inundate all of them. They thought that we were going to create a huge lake. Was not the case, but actually it helped us a lot in understanding a dimension that, you know, sometimes we were not seeing. And that is the social part of a program like this. And thank God that it really happens very early on. Uh, we contracted, um, we asked the, um, the, the United Nations through the PNUD, an office over there, to analyze, you know, what were our stakeholders? You know, what were the questions that we need to answer? And, um, and the person in charge uh, came to me after going and talking to everyone in, in the country, you know, Everyone, you can imagine, you know, uh, unions and Indians and uh, uh, native of all the country and went to look at every aspect. And he, he, pre he presented to us, here's your stakeholders, and it's huge. Everyone wants to know about it. Everyone is concerned. And I said, Alberto, you have a lot of questions to answer, and you don't have them ready yet. And I said, well, yeah, that's, that's true. And uh, so we then engaged in doing more than 150 studies to put together a program that today, you know, it's, it's going well. It's, it's, I think it's, it's extremely well. But that program needed to go and be presented to the people of Panama in our national referendum. So people, you know, used to ask me, why do you want to, uh, why do you have to present an infrastructure project to a natural referendum. And this is one of the extremes, I, I believe, a very important one, because it shows that any project requires to have a 
to be presented to those stakeholders of the civil society so that people can actually, maybe you don't like what they're gonna tell you, but you at least need to hear them and then maybe you can make decisions. And I don't think that you should be caught in corners in, 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 that, in those areas. And that's sometimes some, some of the frustrations people uh, tends to happen when you want to do a project. And sometimes we engineers tends to want to do things very fast and we try to go around things when I think that it adds value and actually makes you a much better and stronger project when you do the things right. And for instance, environmental issues, uh, talking to the people who's going to be affected. Because at the end of the day, when we went to a referendum with this program, we put it together, this master plan, and we presented this in the year 2006 um, to the Republic of Panama, there was a lot of doubt. People asked me, okay, how much money is going to cost? They said it's going to cost $12, $12 billion, that it was, you know, it could not cost $5.2 billion. Uh, they said that there were a lot of risk, that why should we take in the risk? You know, and uh, that there were going to be, you know, awful things happening, that mega projects, you know, they were not uh, okay. And there was, you know, valid criticism, and it was valid concerns, you know, and you have to take it in, the, in, the, in that measure, and you need to basically have the answers for those questions, as hard as they could be. It doesn't matter. Uh, the important thing is that actually you need to tackle them and actually understand, you know, what, you know, actually they, they, they'll bring to you, and then you will have even a stronger project. So in 2006, when we presented this, we went to the people of Panama. We had six months to explain, and we could not put propaganda and spend money of the canal into any of this, saying, you know, please vote yes. Actually, we were constrained, and the only thing we can do was to explain to the people of Panama what were the benefits and the reason why we were presenting this to them. Well, Early on, we thought that you know we could you, we could talk about Panama ships and post Panama ships and amount of monies and billions here, billions there, and construction costs. They didn't care. That was not the question. The question was what is in for me. And you need to ask, answer that question. You need to answer to the people in the mountains of Chiriquí what this represents to them. What were the benefits for them? You know, for a, a, a people who was doing a pineapple farm, what it does represent for them. They don't understand it. Some of them have never seen the canal. In fact, the canal was felt away from, in those days, Panama, Panama was, you know, taking over a, an infrastructure uh, as the canal. But we need to, to actually, it was off limits for most of the people of Panama. The canal zone was off limits. So even though we were very proud of the canal, the canal in itself, you know, people do not, can touch it. You know, they, some of them have never been to the canal. They're very afraid, you know, it was under the US. So that was a, a, a big challenge to, to go and do that. And I have, you know, to say that, you know, we had people from the canal from every uh, areas and they were like a hundred and some of our colleagues in the canal who went out and talked to the people and they, where, you know, uh, they tell you everything, you know. Uh, some people were uh, very hard in some of the questions. Now we went and talked to everyone, every single person, every, every union. The construction union, which is very hard, very tough. I said to the, uh, the people who lead that, I said, look, I'll go there, you know, and I'll present the case. Just, you know, hear me out. If you don't like it, you don't like it, that's okay. We can agree to disagree, no problem, okay. So at the end, we had a great success, and, the, and this was approved by a 78% approval rate. So we have now a very strong mandate. And we started, nine months later, we started the first program, the first construction project, okay? Uh, and it started in September of 2007. Uh, the referendum was in October. So 11 months later, we start the, actually uh, start digging the first program, and we've been working at that very diligently since then. And, uh, and I would like uh, at this time um, to take a break and show you a film that we did basically only a week and a half ago or two weeks ago on where we are in this you know, very large and important project. So let us run this, uh, this film. 
It's a five-minute film. Right here. Sorry, I'll do it. The Panama Canal, an engineering wonder of the world with nearly a century of service. To guarantee its competitive edge in the maritime industry, the waterway undertook since 2007 an ambitious expansion program that will enable the transit of post-Panamax vessels. One challenge in the expansion program is turning the existing entrances and canal navigational channels into suitable channels to enable the 50-foot draft required by post-Panamax ships. On the Pacific side, Belgian company Dredging International brought in the D'Artagnan, one of the world's most powerful dredges, featuring a 6,000 kilowatt cutter head. On the Atlantic side, activities are also non-stop. At one time, Belgian contractor Jean Deneau had up to seven dredges working simultaneously in the area. By the end of March 2011, both contractors had dredged 18 million cubic meters of the planned 26 million. ACP in-house forces have not hesitated when it comes to investing in dependable equipment to conduct dredging activities in Gatun Lake and Culebra Cut. At a cost of $95.9 million, the new cutter suction dredge Kiwi arrived this year to support dredging work in the area. In total, the ACP forces and the contractor have dredged 10.6 million cubic meters through March and thus achieving a 46% progress. In 2011, the toughest part of the construction of the new post Panamax locks will begin, the concrete pouring. This is one of the crucial stages of the contract for the design and construction of the third set of locks. And the Panama Canal Authority is working hand in hand with the contractor to guarantee that the execution maintains its momentum. The magnitude of what the site will become once the post Panamax locks are completed is already noticeable. These, for instance, are the cutouts where the lock heads, the recesses, that will house the 4,000 ton gates will be built. The design of the different components of the third set of locks progress along parallel with the civil construction. In Lyon, France, the Compagnie Nationale du Rhône is conducting the final test on the filling and emptying system of the locks using two additional scale model vessels. These tests will validate the information detailed in the Grupo Unidos por el Canal proposal and in the performance specifications. Through March 2011, Grupo Unidos por el Canal reported an overall 10% progress. To connect the third set of locks in the Pacific with Culebra Cut, a new access channel is under construction since September 2007. By the first quarter of 2011, the contractors have excavated 27.4 million cubic meters of the planned 50 million. This year, we'll also witness the beginning of the construction of the Borinquen Dam. This 2.3 kilometer long barrier will separate the waters of Miraflores Lake from the new channel that is being constructed, enabling its operation 9 meters above the level of the lake. In achieving this task, a 1.8 km long cellular cofferdam system is required first, and it was completed this April. As a complement to the dry excavation, dredging mogul Jean Deneau is conducting dredging and excavation work along 1.6 km at the north entrance to the new channel. These works began on November 2010 to accomplish the removal of 4 million cubic meters. At this time, the contractor has reached excavation levels that are 12 meters below Gatun Lake level. But this project is not just about construction. Reforestation, wildlife, archaeology, 
and paleontology are also linked to the expansion program. Along with local environmental authorities, the Panama Canal is currently reforesting some 565 hectares of land distributed in protected areas all along the country. Treasures have also been dug out along the footprint of the program, including this dagger dating back to the 16th century, or this fossil tree more than 10 million years old. Currently, there are nearly 5,000 workers in the expansion program, and it is expected that another 2,000 job opportunities will be created. They're working around the clock, day and night, in order to complete the project. The Panama Canal expansion, the commitment of Panamanians to complete this project with a sense of national pride and setting an example for the international community. Well, that's uh, where we are today. But also I would like to reflect on getting to put a program of this magnitude together. There is a very important issue that has to be how you're going to manage the pro project like this. And we had the, uh, we contracted through a, a, uh, a bid process, CH2M Hill, which is actually doing a, uh, an integrated team with the Panama Canal. We also needed to prepare our own engineers. We had a program in which we um, provide MBAs first to 100 of our engineers uh, from Incai. And you wonder why I want engineers to be MBAs because, well, basically you are running a, 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 a project, you're running a corporation, and you need to know more about engineering, and you need that, that other part. And I think there are very few companies uh, in all of Latin America who can have 100 MBAs uh, and engineers at the same time working for you. Uh, but also we prepare people and make them, uh, more than 100 of them are actually certified program managers uh, from a PMIS, um, certificate, because we needed to be prepared. Also, Panama put together INADE, which is a, an institution that was created basically to train Panamanians, and that's why today we have most of the people who are working in the expansion are Panamanians. You know, some of those operate of very, very large equipment. Those CAD equipment, in fact, got also put some training facilities to train people in managing or actually operating these very huge equipments that, you know, were not the norm in Panama. So. And I think at the end, that's, it will be a very, very important uh, transfer of technology. And I think that we will have even a, a much better workforce uh, for other projects that Panama will also have to, to do. Uh, as we move forward, then in, uh, in the year 2007, we haven't contracted yet the funding for the financing for this program. And we had uh, a unique effort, we put together five multilateral banks, the IDB Bank, IFC, JBIC, uh, the uh, European uh, uh, um, EIB, um, and CAF. And in a single turn sheet, they got together and they revised and they did the due diligence on this program. And we were able to show some of the times and some of the issues which uh, Prohibited practice is very important in those institutions, as well as the, uh, the area of environment. And I have to say today, and I can say it, and I, we are very proud of it, that the way in which we contracted this program, actually today is the norm in which very large infrastructure projects should be contracted. Because we negotiate with the contractors the terms before and not after. We don't negotiate anything after. And that is very different. Usually, it's important to do a, an analysis of who should get what risk. Because it's about risk taking. Who should be the ones taking the risk if it's better for the owner to manage that or it's better for the contractor to manage the risk. And uh, it took us 14, basically 14 months to do the contracting of the main works. And I, have, I can report that we have already contracted most of the I would say close to 96, 97% of this contract already, of this program has been contracted. We already have finished two projects. Uh, we are basically the third one of the excavation of the Pacific side excavation has already been almost completed. And we are well advanced in all of the dredging programs. 
in, in this, this very complex program. And all of them, with ex without exception, has been under the budget of the Panama Canal Authority. And we don't do the budget to win the projects. We do the budget that I think that it's a, a good price in which we can actually contract this program. And we have done things that are different, which we learn from the industry and actually talking to them. For instance, on dredging, we designed all of the dredging of this program has been designed by the Panama Canal Authority. All of the excavation that is done, all of those actually 50 million cubic meters of excavation in this program has been designed by the, our engineers. When, when you do, in the case of dredging, which is about 55 million cubic meters of, of dredging, we did something that is very, well, actually it's the norm in, in a lot of the, the contracting internationally, is that we sat with the possible contractors. And we gave them, here's what we want you to build. This is the design. This is how many cubic meters of material have to be dredged. And here's kind of, you know, what it, the type of material you will find. But you need to contract between yourselves a company that should do the analysis of what type of material you're going to find. So then between themselves, for instance, on the first dredging project in the Pacific entrance, they did a $1.5 billion study. Among themselves, there were six contractors, six possible contractors, and each one pay his part. Everyone receives the same information. Now, the risk of the material they will find during the dredging is on their contractor, not on the ACP. If we were the ones providing that information, if there was any change in the type of materials, then we could be claimed against. But if it's, their, if there, if there, if it's their own um, information, they have to bear that risk. And everyone has the same information, which is very important. Well, we had a fantastic prices in every single project, and that's the way we've been doing it. Okay? And that is a, a, a modern way to do it. In fact, the winner has to pay the other contractors, you know, the percentage that they each one pay for this study. Okay? So that's the way, and everyone knows the rules. And we know exactly, and we have had all this work done, and there hasn't been any claims. Okay? And most of those projects are basically finished. For instance, Jan Denul in the Pacific, in the Atlantic side, he, he, would, he put seven dredges at one given time. Why? Because when they bid this program, it depends on if they have dredges available, if they, they have already them play, working in, in the country. Uh, Dredging International brought to Panama the largest deeper dredge, I mean, uh, um, cottage suction dredge in the world to do a project that it's, uh, requires a lot of, of rock excavation in the Pacific entrance. Well, it's a very powerful dredge. They have the equipment, they have the capacity. Let them bid for that. We are not the ones who should be telling them what to do and how to do it. They have to take their own risk. So this program, and actually I sat with a Corps of Engineers, they went to visit me in Panama, and they, I, to, for me to explain to them, Panama, now explaining to the Corps, how we were doing this. Because they want to use this model to actually bid for very large infrastructure projects, even in the U.S. So we are very proud of that. I think that we put together a program that actually uh, is being contracted and contracted very efficiently and is doing very well. In fact, we are about $400 million below the expected budget. Hopefully everything will finish. There's still a lot of work to do. There's a lot of things that can happen, but we will try to maintain this very much under budget and ahead of time. And those are very difficult tasks to, to do on a very large and complex project like this one. This is a project that is basically being done around the world. For instance, the designer of this program, of the, uh, of the, of the uh, locks, is Montgomery C. Watson Harsa from Chicago with Tetra, with Tetra uh, Tech. Those are the two largest designers in the world. They are the ones designing this, but they are also designing this with companies in Belgium uh, that are specializing on the gate, for instance, and they are doing what you saw over there, one of the largest ever built um, hydraulic models to test the water saving basins, the water flowing from uh, a, an upper lake to a, a, an ocean that actually changed 18 foot in ties, uh, a lake that actually will move from 89 feet down to uh, 81. So we need to look at all of those hydraulics. And this company, Compañía Nacional Duran, it's being contracted by them 
to do these studies. And actually, I have to also report that the, 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 what it came out of those studies that we basically are already finished is very exciting and very good. You know, it's uh, because they could not start building anything unless we pass the, uh, the test not only on, on mathematical models, but also on physical models, like this one that they built over there. They are also designing the, actually the mathematical models uh, are being done in, in Buenos Aires, Argentina, on a company owned by Montgomery Watson Harsa. And they specialize in these hydraulic mathematical models. And those are working with, you know, with France, with Chicago, with Belgium, and with Panama. You know, and the, uh, for instance, the uh, gates are being built in Italy. All the uh, valves and uh, equipment is being built in, uh, in Korea. In, by Hyundai. So this is a project that actually spanned the world. It's not only, you know, the contractors. It's actually, you got, you got Belgium uh, 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 contractor from Holland doing dredging. So you got all type of, of, uh, of workers, uh, and, and type, I'm sorry, of contractors working in this, in this very exciting program. Now, what will happen when we open the canal in, in 2014, um, when we expect this to be open? In fact, I think that uh, we have said it is a game changer. And why is it a game changer? Because actually by allowing now a ship that the Panamax in terms of container, for instance, is a 4,400 TEU ship. Well, we'll be able to actually already, the, the industry is designing a Panamax, the new Panamax ship that actually we call the design vessel to be able to carry over 14,000 containers fitting the dimensions that we have as our design. We were thinking about a 12,000 TEU ship. Now they're already gone up to 14,000. When we talk about bulkers, in the canal we can only move a 60,000 dead weight ton ship. We're gonna be looking at a ship that is about 170,000 dead weight ton ship. Three times more, almost three times more. Now what happens? There is, there, for instance, there in energy. We cannot move LNG through the Panama Canal, because the size of the ships doesn't fit. The LNG tankers are not Panamax in size, are larger than Panamax. Well, there's a lot of gas even here in the U.S., in Peru, in the, in the Caribbean, uh, and now you can actually be transferring from one ocean to the other. When we look at what happened in Panama in terms of transshipment, in the year 1995, in Panama, 96, we only moved 200,000 containers a year. This past year, we moved 5.6 million TEUs. We became the number one port in Latin America. We surpassed Santos in Brazil, this tiny country of Panama. We have more cranes in Panama because we have 52 overhead cranes for containers. Well, it just happened that that's 23% of all the cranes in Latin America. We have more cranes in Panama container cranes that Mexico has. We got more cranes than Brazil has. We got more cranes than Chile. See, and that is about basically being able, because when I said that we have better things than Singapore in, in, in basically location and position, because we have a long way to go to get to Singapore. That is because we can connect two oceans. Singapore do not connect two oceans. We connect the Pacific and the Atlantic. And we actually can, can actually get to a very large market that is Latin America. And that is why Panama is a game changer, because we now allow larger vessels to go from one ocean to the other, and therefore you can have great economy of scales, huge economies of scale. Okay. And that should benefit, and that's why there's a huge discussion going on today. And that's what I am so glad about, because we are here now talking, the Pan Panama is now presenting to the U.S. and to the world a game changer in terms of infrastructure change. And now the discussion around the, all these is uh, seaboard in the U.S. is who's going to be the winners? Where should the investment be made here in the U.S.? The same thing happened in the Gulf. See, there's a huge difference between being able to move soybeans in Panama size ships than moving soybeans in three times the capacity. It gives the U.S. soybean exporters or corn exporters a huge advantage to get to the market in a most efficient way because when you have a low-cost product or commodity, 
the cost of transportation is very large. And if you can reduce that part, then you make it, you actually made it much more efficient. Mm -hmm. Then what happened to Panama? For us, the same thing. We have the capacity to go to any market. That's why when we are basically selling pineapples to Europe, we have the capacity to basically contact or transport that pineapple in a very efficient way. Because we have the port system, we have the, no, more important than the port system, we have the lines connecting to those ports. So we, are, we can have access to that, uh, that connectivity because Panama is the country with more connectivity in Latin America, and in fact, the number two in the Americas. The number one is the U.S. Besides the U.S., then it's Panama. So that is why when I said early on that for us, the important about the expansion of the Panama Canal is not about allowing larger vessels to go through. It's actually to maximize what we can offer as a country and maximize that, uh, that location that we do have. And it's about adding value. At the end of the day, it's about adding value. And how should also we, how we can capture value from the value that we offer. And that is why, you know, nowadays we have these discussions and that's why the canal has been able to price itself properly and actually to, to get money, you know, to, to be able to do uh, what we're doing. And it actually, you know, just as a reflection, we had an interesting discussion one time, uh, just to close out, uh, with the industry. And during the, the debate for the uh, expansion, some of them said to me, uh, you know, I'm really sure, but why are you charging us, the industry now, you know, for something that we are not the ones going to use it? You know, why don't you charge that money later? I said, you know, I think that you got it all wrong. Because, you know, I provide you a service. And when you use that service, like when you go and buy a Coke, you drink your Coke. Okay? And you don't tell Coke what to do with the money in which they sell you that Coke. Okay? <laughs> So I provide you a service today. The canal provides you a service today that I am sure that you pass that on to your clients and you charge for that service today. We are the ones taking the risk. You are not paying for any Panama Canal expansion. You got it all wrong. We are paying for the Panama Canal expansion ourselves. We are the ones putting, we are the ones betting for that. We are the ones who are actually burying that money in our country, expanding the Panama Canal, because I believe that we're going to supply you with service that we can actually gained from, from doing that. We are the ones putting $5.25 billion in this infrastructure because you have one big advantage over me, and that is that you have ships, that you have engines, and you can move them around. So I am going to offer something that I'm, not, I'm sure that is going to be of benefit to you, and that's why you're going to be using it. And that actually is what really happens. You know, we are basically providing a service, and we will continue to provide a service. And I think that that has value. And, I, and today, we see the industry actually moving and contracting bigger vessels, new Panama sized ships, and everyone is now trying to position themselves to get advantage of the Panama Canal expansion, which is fantastic. And I love it. I actually, I think that our bet is going to be a very safe bet. And actually, I think that it will enhance Panama even further. So with that, I just like to, uh, to thank you again for your time and uh, for allowing me to basically explain to you what's going on in Panama. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Alberto. Very, very interesting. And, and uh, uh, just to set uh, your comments uh, in context, I'd like to call on Bill Lane, the director of, uh, of uh, government relations for Caterpillar Tractor to uh, provide uh, a sense of, uh, of uh, what this means in terms of construction and jobs. Bill? Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, you, know, you know, sometimes uh, you get to deal with uh, projects that uh, touch history. Sometimes you get to deal with projects that actually make history, and this is one of the things that I, I think we all can be most proud of. Uh, I was really eager to uh, accept this invitation because it's very rare where you really get a chance to talk about the nexus between infrastructure and trade. Um, you know, we, we, we live in a, in a time where there's been all sorts of chatter about expanding uh, infrastructure in the United States, and it's usually within the rubric of a jobs program. And I would say if, if that's the theme, uh, it's, it's really short-sighted. Because, you know, if you're borrowing money to just sort of make work, 
that's really not improving the efficiency of your, your economy. But if you're borrowing money to improve the efficiency of your, your economy, that's a, that's a dividend that's going to pay, uh, or that's an investment that's going to pay dividends forever. I mean, when you think of the U.S., probably the, the, the most transformational infrastructure project was the Erie Canal, which ultimately resulted in the commercial center of the U.S. moving from Philadelphia to New York because it, it uh, linked the Midwest. But what's going on in Panama is equally as great. And within a Washington context, we spend almost all of our time talking about trade agreements and ways to remove trade barriers from a tariff or a quota standpoint. Uh, what's going on in Panama is really removing trade barriers. Uh, the, the, the canal expansion is the most visible uh, manifestation of that. But there's gr more going on in Panama than just that. I mean, and, and think about this. The, uh, the airport in Panama City is being quadrupled in size. COPA is being upgraded to truly a world-class airline. Over 30 new American Boeing jets are going to be purchased, all with GE uh, engines. And all of a sudden, you're going to see as a transportation hub uh, Panama for the entire hemisphere. From a Caterpillar perspective, first of all, I have to tell you, we really get excited when we see our equipment on. on, on this. I mean, we really do. I mean, moving dirt, really, I mean, that's what we're all about. I mean, it's, uh, you know, everybody else has other things. It's fashion or money. or I mean, we just like dirt. And we even like mud. Mud's good, too. So, I mean, but this works out really good. So the fact that, that Caterpillar was championing the Latin FTAs shouldn't be um, uh, come as a surprise. A couple things we learned in this exercise. One is we all have to do a lot better job communicating. Um, with the, even with the administration, and the administration always had a uh, propensity to move forward. They just didn't want to take on some um, um, interests that were anti-trade. But what really, I think, shocked the administration was when a number of businesses pointed out that, well, from a Caterpillar perspective, Colombia, we export more to Colombia than we do to India or Germany or Japan. That's not to say they're not bigger markets. But most American companies tend to service their Latin American clients through exports from the United States. Whereas when you're servicing uh, Asia, it tends to be more of a mix between what's made in Asia and what's made in the United States. Uh, what really shocked the administration was when we pointed out that last year, we exported more American-made products to Panama than we did to Korea. And that's not to take anything away from Korea. But that's just to say that when you have an opportunity to open three markets versus one, you want them open three markets. And as a result of that, we, we played a very leadership role. I just got word this morning that, and some of you may know this story, but let me just uh, tell it anyway because it's sort of fun. Uh, in December, we, uh, we, we made a real push to um, uh, make sure the administration didn't lose sight of the opportunity to open all three markets. And in a way to sort of visualize that, we took an ad out in Politico. And it, you'll have a copy of, uh, of the ad when you, when you leave here. And it showed a football, uh, uh, a field goal post. And uh, the headline was, this is not the time to kick a field goal on trade. And the, the operative line, which quite frankly the administration didn't find all that funny, um, was passing the Korea, or passing the Korea Free Trade Agreement while keeping Panama and Colombia on the sidelines is the equivalent of kicking a field goal on second down. Um, we just got word that that won the highest platinum award for advertising this morning for create creativity. So, you know, don't ever let it be said a 5,000 ad can actually make a difference. But it really did uh, coalesce people's views that, you know, maybe we need to think bigger rather than smaller. And in a period of three months, to the administration's credit, to the Republican leadership's credit, and to the business community's credit, you know, folks did coalesce around the notion that we need to do more, not less. Um, let me just uh, wrap up by saying a couple of things. Meredith's going to talk at, uh, at length about the trade agreement. But let me just put this more in a uh, uh, yeah, U.S. perspective. And Alberto talked about it. I don't care if you don't make anything that has to do with... Um, with earth moving equipment. If you do, that's even better. But think about this from a, from a supply chain standpoint. A more efficient Panama Canal reduces your supply chain, which means almost all American manufacturers become more efficient and better able to compete in the global economy. 
don't think in a micro standpoint, don't think that this is the be all and end all. As was pointed out, this is going to result in an awful lot of uh, construction projects along the coast of the United States and in the Gulf as ports have to expand to be able to handle the larger ships. That's going to generate jobs. That's going to make US, uh, uh, the inf US infrastructure more efficient. Um, think in terms, if you have a goal of doubling exports, we, we're going to have a lack of infrastructure to accomplish that. Now, so far, the goal of doubling exports only, or it really should be doubling trade. But for now, let's handle just exports. You need to have more capacity at the ports. You need to have more uh, uh, feeder uh, roads and railroads in order to actually accomplish that. Because if you're doubling exports, you're doubling the amount of goods you're, you're, you're selling. You're also going to have to increase imports. And, and I think sometimes we lose sight of the fact. While exports are very, very important, imports are important too. And, and many times it's the imports that give you the, uh, the vitality of, of your economy and it allows you to uh, ratchet up your, your level of competition so you really are more competitive. Um, let, let me just say two things I'd like to leave you with. And this is one thing <clears throat> that I think the Panamanians have done better than any. And it's something I think we have to regain. We've got to regain a sense of urgency when it comes to projects, when it comes to change, when it comes to making the, the big fixes that's going to improve the economy. Uh, you can avoid eye contact on tough issues and sort of drag things out. I think the Republicans like to say kicking the can down the, the road. But, you know, people talked about the Panama Canal expansion, you know, five years ago, six years ago. And, they, you know, I remember when I was first hearing about it, really, it was actually 10 years ago, and they said, this is going to be a $5 billion project. And, of course, in my mind, I said, oh, that means it's going to be a $10 billion project. Because that's what happens in the U.S. It's still a $5 billion project. It's ahead. In some ways, I think, uh, I think you're, you're actually uh, ahead of cost. You're on time. We used to do things like that. <laughs> and there's no reason why we can't do it again. Our equipment is more efficient than it's ever been. Our workers are more productive than they've ever been. Yet every day we, we commute to work and we hear about the inter-county connector being eh, a couple more decades away. And uh, I, I guess eventually we're, we're getting there now. But the point is, we need a sense of urgency as far as addressing our issues. And we can learn from, uh, from Panama in that regard. Secondly, CATS made some investments in Panama. And some of it has to do with supporting the activities as, as far as the expansion. But some of it has to do with our own policies. Uh, you know, we used to like to bring workers into the U.S. to be trained. But it's very hard to get visas. And so if you want to be a diesel engine mechanic or if you want to learn how to service some of our equipment, it really takes a Herculean task to get folks to come in for a couple of weeks to get that kind of training from Latin America. We're now setting up a training center in Panama. It's a good investment. It's employed a, a lot of Panamanians. But what it does, it allows us to stay in touch with our customers and the folks that run our machines. So, you know, there's other issues we have to address dealing with immigration issues and business travel issues and things of that sort. And let me just end with a, with a phrase that we've probably heard for a long time that, you know, you know, Panama has always seen itself as someday being the Singapore of the Western Hemisphere. You know, I was in Asia recently, and in Singapore, they're now saying, someday we're going to be the Panama of Asia. So I, I think you've accomplished it. We're proud to be part of the expansion. We're proud to be one of the leaders of the, uh, the free trade agreements uh, with Panama and Colombia. And I really think that when we, we look out 90 days from now, we're going to see that an awful lot has been accomplished. And when you, when you think in terms of countries where there is really a bright future in Latin America, we used to just focus on Chile. Now it's Colombia and Panama. Folks are showing the way that other countries can follow. And so not only are we benefiting directly, but I think we're going to be benefiting over the intermediate and long term. Because what you're doing is you're setting an example for others to follow. And that's going to be good for Latin America, and that's going to be good for the United States. Thank you very much. Meredith, the floor is yours. And then we'll have about uh, um, probably about 10 minutes for questions and answers. Thank you very much. Um, the, uh, you sort of think about what you, how you want to put a context, in, into context a trade agreement like this, which is, has actually uh, 
been in thought and in construction since November 18, 2003, when President Bush actually notified the Congress of his intent to negotiate a free trade agreement with uh, the Republic of Panama. And I was just thinking back, I have a son who's a junior in college. He was in seventh grade at that point. And he's now an engineering student, and I'm hoping that he, Alberto may consider him as an as a intern this summer, <laughs> where he can learn a little bit about this you know, all-American market segmentation that, that we've got going at the Panama Canal. Um, very, very gripping story and an, and an exciting thing for all of us to hear about. And we're lucky that Alberto would come and, and give us his uh, down-to-earth assessment of what's going on there on the ground. Uh, the, the update I have on the free trade agreement for all of you who I know are following this closely and know this as well, but, but just to sit back and appreciate some of the mile markers that we've come to at this point since 2003, uh, you know, we now have uh, legislative language for implementing a free trade agreement up on the Hill that's there, transmitted informally, sitting in front of the, the congressional staff and the attorneys, along with administration attorneys, you know, looking at these agreements and coming up with the right language. And that is just a huge accomplishment that we've got and we're, we're well on our way and things are going quickly is my, my impression on, on implementing this long overdue free trade agreement. Uh, it will stand, as I think, as a symbol to a country that, that uh, is really a, a peaceful crossroads for maritime commerce, both east and west. They've been a, a longtime ally of the United States, a friend in a very difficult part of the world where we worry about drug interdiction and organized crime and uh, keeping uh, the, ro the roads and the, the maritime ways safe coming up from, the, from Latin America. So it uh, is a vibrant place that offers an awful lot of opportunities. I think we've missed some, unfortunately. I think if, if this agreement had been implemented a bit earlier, we would have been in a, a better position as a country to have some of our, our companies take advantage. Uh, but there is a, a renewed sense of urgency, I think, that, that Bill alluded to that's, that's very important, and we're well on the road to, to having a success. Um, some of the, the statistics are just huge, and I'm not going to bore you because I know folks here have, have followed them closely, but Panama is one of the fastest growing economies in the Americas. It's expanding at more than 6% a year. It's forecast to sustain that performance for probably the next four or five years. Uh, this, the United States needs to participate as fully as possible in this economy so that we can take advantage of the growth that the Panamanians are enjoying and make it a mutually reciprocal beneficial relationship. Uh, as we know, we all worked, a lot of folks, I see familiar faces in the room that worked on the Caribbean Basin Trade Partnership Act uh, that was instituted in the 90s. We, we give duty-free treatment on a permanent basis to most of Panama's exports to the United States. Um, Panamanian producers and service providers don't face any, any barriers here, but our goods going into Panama at this point face tariffs from 7 to some are 260 percent. So getting those uh, phased out is, is crucial for, for this economy that's looking for job creation, and this is job creation that doesn't cost anything. Over 80% of U.S. exports of consumer and industrial products to Panama will become duty-free immediately with the remaining tariffs phased out over 10 years. We're going to be able to cooperate our, uh, consolidate um, our partnerships and cooperate cooperative relationships and really strengthen our deep cultural and historic ties with this, this very important ally. So I think we've got a good kickoff today for what is going to be a really exciting couple of months on Capitol Hill as, as we see the United States kind of come back and get in the game on trade, you know, and get more U.S. companies with their banners doing uh, big full-scale production projects uh, in the hemisphere. Thank you, Meredith, uh, very much uh, for that perspective. Uh, Meredith is the uh, uh, a senior advisor for CSIS and, and uh, holds the Shoal Chair in international business. I'd like to open it up for uh, questions that you might have for either Mr. Zub uh, Aleman Zubieta, Bill Lane, or Meredith Broadbent. Um, I'd just ask if you'd raise your hand so that uh, um, our uh, intern scholars that have microphones could come and, and give you the mic so that everybody can, can hear what uh, you have to say. Hi, thank you very much. Andrew Beatty from the AFP News Agency. Um, we've seen uh, re in recent months that uh, 
the trade deficit between uh, the US and China has narrowed slightly. I'm wondering if you're seeing that in traffic um, flows. And secondarily, if you, do you think there's any long-term uh, risk for the canal that in China becoming a less, less ex export-driven economy? Thank you. Oh, yes. Um, yes, we have seen this year, um, I think that we're going to go to a record year in the Panama Canal. Um, so far, we're about 20 million tons more in the first six months of our fiscal year than last year, which we had um, in those, that last, last year we were about over 300 million. The maximum the canal has ever had is 312 million Panama Canal tons, so I think that we're going to uh, uh, basically break that record this year. Uh, and we are, you know, moving, we, got, we have seen the, uh, basically every segment uh, of the, uh, in the canal actually has a very positive um, uh, flow uh, in the canal. Uh, that's, uh, to answer that question, you know, we have seen that, that improvement, basically, uh, is reflected in the canal traffic. Uh, on China, I think that, um, that the canal, not only serve that trade, you know, it's, we serve a Asia to uh, east coast of the U.S. is the main trade of the, of the canal, uh, for sure. But we, are, we will be seeing not only that, I don't think that China is going to uh, simply disappear of the, of the, uh, of the world market. Uh, obviously, there will be competition. There will be some, um, uh, there are some movements to Vietnam and to uh, India. Uh, but then when you look at the infrastructure that China has, uh, actually allows, it's not only about, and some people tend only to look at the cost of, of, uh, of uh, labor, and I think there's a lot other things besides labor that actually impact more the supply chain than the cost of labor itself. I think that also as uh, China, it's becoming in itself a consumer, also provides benefit for actually being, you know, building uh, parts or products in China. Uh, so I don't see China going away anytime soon uh, or in the future. In the back. Hello, oh, thank you for your time. Um, could all of you per address some potential security concerns with the increased flow of traffic? Well, the uh, the security is always paramount. Uh, there is a I have actually I've been to Congress before when I was uh, the, uh, the Panama Canal. Commission Administrator, and I believe strongly that the best way to protect the Panama Canal is through intelligence. You know, we do have a very sophisticated system for all kinds of cameras and things like that, you know, hardware, but at the end of the day, it's about intelligence, you know, um, and I think that's where we need to focus um, and be ready to actually prevent rather than actually react after the fact, and that's what I have to say on that. Bill? Yes. I, I, go ahead, Meredith. I don't have anything to add. Well, I think, Steve, you may want to respond to this because, you know, my sense is that we have very high-level security relationships with the Panamanian government, but I haven't studied those closely. Well, I didn't want to have to say anything today, but uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I'll, I'll be happy to, to add, add on to that. I, I think it's very important to, uh, obviously, with increased uh, traffic flows, there uh, are uh, increased vulnerabilities and uh, also the, the need to be able to, to track those flows. Panama, I think, with this project stands at the forefront of being able to do that. Uh, some of the other ports uh, in uh, the Americas are probably a little bit less prepared uh, to be able to participate in that. And I, be, I mean by that being able to track what's inside containers, being able to track the, the containers themselves, and being able to secure their own uh, port facilities. Then there's the, the question of what actually uh, goes through the canal it, itself. Uh, fortunately, we have uh, 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 exercises that uh, are hosted uh, jointly by Southcom and the government of Panama called Panamax uh, exercises that, that test uh, some of these vulnerabilities and, and uh, exercise ways with uh, uh, host coast guards, uh, um, navies in, in being able to meet some of these threats. So I, I think that uh, uh, we're cognizant that these things are going to continue to increase. They're not things that we can uh, eliminate. They're not 
um, threats that anybody can stop, uh, but they're situations that re require control and being able to to uh, be technologically and in, in terms of personal proficiency uh, ready to, to be able to meet them. And I think that uh, we're on the way to, to doing that as long as we cooperate uh, well among the countries of uh, the hemisphere. And these exercises are uh, draw participants from different countries uh, in the hemisphere. I think we're just about uh, at the end, but uh, we'll take two more questions. What we'll do is if we could take them um, one right after another, uh, th then we'll allow the, the panelists to, to answer both of them. So the gentleman in the back and then uh, the lady in the front. Uh, hi, this question is for uh, Mr. Aleman. Uh, what, uh, what changes have you seen in terms of uh, shipping based on the higher price of oil? Are companies adjusting to the way that they're shipping because of that? Fewer, uh, fewer boats coming through or just a different strategy in terms of how to get things from point A to point B? Well, the answer to that one is that there, there's been uh, uh, a lot of consolidation in the industry. That happens, um, and it happens not only because of oil, but actually uh, when the uh, we got into the crisis in uh, 2008 and 9. Um, but one other thing is that uh, that there is a what they call uh, um, slow um, shipping, the slow movement of, of, of the ships. They they now uh, are moving at lower speeds. Um, uh, and that it's uh, to reduce the cost of, uh, of, of, of energy. Uh, and that, that's, uh, that, that type of um, uh, is affecting uh, somehow, you know, they need to put more vessels in the, uh, in, in the system. Uh, but at the same time, they're saving a lot of money in, in, the, in the cost of energy. And that, that slow steaming, as it's called, is uh, it's it's an ongoing, um, uh, was a procedure that the uh, shipping lines are are taking to basically reduce the cost of uh, of, of fuel, and that will be the major change they have done. Hello, Betty Brannan from La Prensa of Panama. My question is: China has announced its intention to build a canal through Colombia that would compete with the Panama Canal. I wonder how Mr. Aleman reacts to. Well, they also announced at one time that we're going to do the one in Nicaragua. Uh, yes, the, uh, the Atrato, the Canal in Atrato, actually, and, uh, and the one in Nicaragua and many others in, in the region are not new uh, to us. The, um, in fact, this is a rail, uh, supposedly a, a rail that will connect uh, the productions for coal, uh, basically, and uh, also they are talking about actually putting a city or something like that to... Uh, for the export of, uh, of containers. Uh, we don't see it. Honestly, uh, I don't think that, and every expert in the industry actually has reacted to that. Um, so yes, there are this type of announcements that comes from time to time. What I do believe, and I have said it, uh, because I have seen you know, canals, dry canals in, uh, uh, and I don't think they pose a competition to the Panama Canal, Betty. Um, if you are moving, even if you are moving coal, Okay, and you have to move the coal from the uh, Atlantic in Colombia uh, all the way in a very long rail, uh, and then you have to go to the ports. You will need a lot of cars to move the amount of cargo that we can move in the Panama Canal. And actually, there are some issues very interesting that can happen, because now we are talking about maybe the possibility of actually topping off, you know, uh, and that means that to basically fill ships that actually are even uh, who can come through the Panama Canal, uh, but they are not, uh, let's say, fully loaded, even with the expanded canal. What you can do is actually to top that off. And you mean that you will have another vessel in Panamanian water after they cross the canal, and then you fin finish filling it up, so then it will go fully loaded into the, into the long, long leg. So there's an alternative that now we even are, can explore that were not there before. Uh, and that will do away with a lot of these, these ideas, okay? What I do believe, though, and, I, and I, I am strong about this, is that Latin America, just like in the U.S., we need to invest very heavily in our own infrastructure 
sometimes, and I think that is even more when I just mentioned in my uh, remarks, that we are still away from being Singapore. You know, and I point out more in the system that Singapore has adopted and took them about four years to do, in which now in, in, you can be, in, you are exporting out of Singapore or importing, you can do that, all the paperwork and requirements, uh, permits, you know, from your desk and you will get that in maybe in 10 minutes when it usually takes you, you know, weeks and even months to get the permits before. Now, that's a very, you know, large program because there's a lot of cost in that bureaucracy that doesn't add any value. And then we tend to have different elements saying, you know, I want to say, you know, yes on this, yes on that. And we need to work on that. But also in the infrastructure, because we, now we have regions like Central America having free trade agreements with the U.S. Well, how are we going to compete, you know, efficiently if we cannot get our products out of in an efficient manner? And there is a study by the World Bank in how much is lost in the production in our countries because of lack of real good infrastructure and lack of or the excess of bureaucracy in some of these issues. There is no reason why, uh, Betty, we could not have, you know, and there is uh, the advantage of getting the Panama Canal or this infrastructure we're putting because I, uh, when, when I look at moving a, a container from, let's say, Guatemala, okay, to the city of Panama, or even Costa Rica, which is actually near. Well, you never know how much, how long it's going to take. It depends if the if the border is closed or open, because they might be out for lunch, or today is Sunday and I don't work on Sundays, or we need to change the tractor that actually is moving the container because now it has to be a Costa Rican uh, operator in that one rather than a Panamanian one. You know that is nonsense. Okay, if you do the same thing in Europe, and I make this study for the for the IDB Bank. Okay, you can have, you're going to load a, a, a container in Hamburg, in Germany, and take it all the way to uh, Sevilla in, in Spain in something like 28 hours. The same distance in Central America will take you weeks. Okay? And that is cost that actually doesn't have any sense. I have people in, um, we are doing a work in, in, in Incae now, the private sector with Incae, trying to analyze this, this, this issue. And there was a, a person from Nicaragua. And this guy exports beef through Panama. Well, the problem that he has is that because of this paperwork and these customs that, you know, that are close and, uh, you know, he said, I could actually be able to export beef that is not frozen, okay, to markets getting a much bigger uh, value on my exports, but I cannot do it because of this problem that I, I'm facing. And this is from Nicaragua to Panama, okay? So we don't see that. And I think that that's where we need to focus. And I think that all of these ports, I am glad that you know Chile is doing LNG facilities, that uh, Peru is now having better ports in Callao, that hopefully Costa Rica will have better ports in, uh, in, in the area, that El Salvador built a port facility and they don't have cranes. Things like that, you know, and, and I hope that they can actually be able to export better because you open markets, you open more uh, volume, and then we all benefit. Uh, I think that at the end of the day, that is about, you know, uh, investing properly in infrastructure. Yeah, allow me just to uh, sort of conclude with one, one just to build upon uh, on those comments, Alberto's comments, because, you know, I actually abbreviated sort of my stump speech, which is, you know, you have man-made uh, trade barriers, which are quotas and tariffs, and that's what, you know, we try to address with free trade agreements and multilateral agreements. You have uh, man-made barriers, and that's what the Panamanians are doing as far as infrastructure in the United States, hopefully we're going to be doing. But the third type are sort of the uh, trade barriers you put on yourself. And uh, you can do that by embracing protectionism, but in some ways you can even be more sinister. Uh, if you see your customs department as a way to employ people rather than a way to facilitate trade, that's a trade barrier. And in some countries, it's, it's marginal, but in a lot of countries in Latin America and Africa and Asia, it's far more than marginal. And it really is more pernicious than a lack of infrastructure or a lack of, uh, of, of uh, market opening trade agreements and what have you. And maybe that'd be a good topic for, a, for another CSIS uh, program, just the importance of uh, capacity building and what that type of payoff could be from, uh, from efficiencies and expanded trade opportunities. But this, I mean, 
this really is a big deal, and it really is a, it's a self-created trade barrier, which uh, really puts a, an enormous uh, uh, penalty on your own economy. Yeah, just, to, just to finish a, a, a thought on that, for instance, when, when you talk about this idea of putting rail in the, into the Pacific side of, of, of Colombia, well, you know, you have a huge area of Colombia that doesn't have access, okay? By putting either roads or, ha or rail or things, you are actually promoting more exports out of that region. You will make that region even more with more production capacity, and therefore, at the end of the day, it better our possibility of having flows from the Pacific to the Atlantic. It's, it's actually benefiting all the way around, and I think that, that really one issue that Latin America do have and, and we are actually lacking is proper infrastructure to actually be able to compete because otherwise we're going to be condemned that the only way we can compete is going to be on having low wages and I don't think that that is the way to do it. Otherwise, you know, I always put, put the question, how can we compete with a, and what are the ways here in the U.S.? Are we really, do, do we really believe that only the, the, uh, the uh, uh, people are putting uh, uh, factories in China because low wages? You know, let's try to do factories in China when they don't have ports or they don't have trains or they don't have highways ready to, to do because it will be so expensive that there's no way you can do it. So that is why you need to look at the whole picture. And that's why you need to invest in infrastructure to really be competitive about, you know, and actually create more markets. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Alberto Aliman, Bill Lane, and Meredith Broadbent. <laughs>